There are not many stories of informal truces between enemies during times of war, and World War I had the informal Christmas truce of December 24th, 1914 through January 1st, 1915 between German and British forces on the Western Front. Both sides crossed no man's land, met, exchanged gifts, and according to the story, even played a soccer match against each other. Many of these soldiers even exchanged addresses so that they could meet up again after the war should they survive. Such was the mutual feeling that the war was pointless in their eyes. However, things were quite different on the Eastern Front, which was just as brutal and the conditions even worse for both Germans and Russians. Yet amazingly, during the winter months of January to February of 1917, a similar event occurred, but for a very different reason. What would make German and Russian soldiers join forces and work together after a year of brutal fighting? How do they operate side by side as allies in a mutual fight for survival? What was the mutual enemy that they faced? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author. And we've answered these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. Near the end of 1916, in the area of Lithuania and Belarus in the Kovno Vilna Minsk district, near modern Vilnius, Lithuania, starving wolves had been attacking civilians, and several children had been killed. Prolonged hunger, the destruction of habitat caused by artillery and depletion of their natural food sources, the deer and wild boar, had become stronger motivators for the animals to lose their fear of people. At first, the packs of wolves attacked isolated victims, usually feeding upon the dead, but then became emboldened to attack the wounded soldiers who were bleeding and not highly mobile. One story emerged of a Russian field hospital full of wounded men that was attacked by dozens of wolves. Being behind the lines, these men were not armed, so the carnage was total. But soon, they grew bolder and began to attack groups of soldiers in the field, and the Germans began to experience these events as well. Reports came in from the front commanders to the desk of Colonel General Hermann Emil Gottfried von Eichhorn, commanding the 10th Army headquartered in Tannenberg. Eichhorn was a recipient of the Poor Marit with Oak Leaves, the famous Blue Max, one of the highest orders bestowed for bravery in combat in Imperial Germany. Eichhorn took these reports about the wolves seriously, and he passed them on to the German Imperial High Command in Berlin, the shocking news landing on the desk of Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. The reports were very explicit, claiming that hundreds of wolves were attacking German soldiers. However, the Imperial Russian High Command was receiving the same information, and both sides initially doubted the accuracy of the reports. General Vladimir Nikolaevich Gorbatovsky, who was the former commander of the Russian 12th Army, and now the commander of the Russian 10th Army, even issued orders for special teams of snipers. These were mostly hunters serving in the Russian army, and they were ordered to hunt the wolves down. The problem was that many of these skilled hunters never returned, and reports were even worse than before. Survivors who made it back claimed that there were hundreds of wolves, not a few dozen, that were roaming the forests and attacking the soldiers. So dire was the situation on the front, and not just because of the large numbers of wolves, Tsar Nicholas II paid a visit to the senior leaders to bolster morale as he had taken over total control of the military. Meanwhile, the Germans in their trenches were also feeling the attacks, and reconnaissance patrols were increased in size to include carrying a Spandau machine gun and trained crew as a precaution. Finally, in February of 1917, there was a message from Berlin stating that they understood that large packs of wolves had moved from the forests of Lithuania and Volhynia to the interior of the German Empire well into East Prussia and even Pomerania. The wolf attacks only increased as the soldiers from both sides tried their best to kill the fearless and hungry animals. There were repeated attempts by the Germans to poison the wolves using strychnine and cyanide, baiting deer and even dead soldiers' corpses. Both sides also tried to kill them with rifles, machine guns, and even grenades. Strafing from aircraft was also conducted. German artillery fired chlorine gas into the forest when the wolves were detected. Both sides even used their reconnaissance aircraft to try and locate 
the massive wolf packs, which often meant little since radio communications did not yet exist. By the time the pilots returned to file their reports and plot the animals on a map for the ground commanders, the wolves were usually no longer in the same area. The ground commanders in the field had to deal with the immediate reality while their respective superiors in Berlin and St. Petersburg read the reports. Their men were being killed. Individual unit commanders decided that something had to be done, and this is where the story really begins. Based on the current situation, the commanders of the German and Russian armies were forced to allow their individual battalion and company commanders to use their discretion and, when necessary, announce a temporary truce and join forces to fight the wolves. It was an agreement among the snipers that if the Russians and Germans decided to engage in a collective wolf hunt, all firing would cease. In one of the most unusual events in history, Germans and Russians formed platoons, even companies, in mutual hunting parties. Thanks to the coordinated efforts, the soldiers managed to kill several hundred wolves and forced the rest to depart. After the predator problem was solved and the wolves were no longer posing a threat to the troops, fighting resumed and all thoughts of cooperation were forgotten. There has been great skepticism about this story for a century, which was well known among the Germans, and apparently even Russians speak about it. One World War I veteran, a seasoned Eastern Front reconnaissance pilot and nine victory ace, Hans Bauer, stated, quote, I heard about the wolves. We all did. This was a problem, especially at our airfield. You could hear howling, but we were never attacked. But we did not have anything resembling great security as we were farther behind the lines. I understand that the infantry in the area did have these problems, end quote. Regardless of where your opinion may fall on this story, it is worth considering that it was reported, and as Hans Bauer stated, at least the Germans knew about the problem. How deeply involved were the two opposing forces allied together in addressing the problem? We may never know. What we do know is that sometimes mutual survival is dependent upon mutual cooperation. We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe for free. And please stay tuned and be engaged and informed. Send us comments if you have questions or even show ideas. And we will respond to all requests and comments as soon as we can. Thank you.